Chris. First off, I want to know who you're voting for. And number two, if the right person doesn't get in office, it's the end. You know that, right? You got to put all your money into T-bills. You got to get out of the market and you got to find that fallout shelter. Boy, I feel like I'm, I'm talking to uh, the investing public today. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I'm, I'll tell you who I am going to vote for. I'm going to vote for one of the candidates. How much have we heard right now about, I want to wait to make any decisions about my portfolio to after the election. Mm-hmm. It drives me crazy because it's probably the worst decision you can make. Yeah. And you hear this every four years. And I don't think it matters how much we can tell people, you know, that historically it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which party's in office. Like election years tend to be a good thing. And it's just because you have that certainty of who's going to be in office the next four years. But realistically, the markets are just made up of a bunch of humans who tend to invest emotionally rather than rationally. And you tend to get that every four years, regardless of what the data shows you. Yeah. And Bob, who's on vacation this week in Naples, must be nice. <laughs> It likes to say that you know the, the high correlation between the stock market can go up in ash- having a president. That's all that matters. Mm-hmm. And the thing that it comes back to is markets love certainty. No matter what it is, they love certainty. And we saw this four years ago. Markets melted up mm-hmm. after the election because we just knew what we were getting. And you're seeing this right now. Like a lot of companies are holding off on deals right now. Um, a lot of companies are holding off on hiring people till after the election. These are going to be huge catalysts. But the stock market's going to be ahead of that. So it's like you've got to embrace the uncertainty now. And I guarantee most people won't do it. You know, I was actually talking to my brother-in-law over the weekend, and he owns a uh, cabinet-making business. And he said the same thing. He said that, you know, his clients have basically, you know, have battened down the hatches. They're not doing anything after the election. But, you know, once the election comes and things are more certain, people will probably start doing stuff. I actually told him to raise his prices. (laughs) Get that pre-election discount. Get that pre-election discount. No, it's a good idea. Which is kind of the same thing with the market. You know, you've got a pre-election discount right now. And I think that's something people don't appreciate. They say, oh, I want to wait until I know what's going to happen with the election. I want to wait to see if we're going into recession. Like once you have that certainty, the markets have already moved and they've already priced it in. And that's something like you have to get in there beforehand and not after. Yeah, like amen, right? yeah, uncertainty is not your ally as an investor, right? Yeah. And we've seen this the whole way through. Like, I just went and wait and see if we have a recession. Well, we didn't. And you just missed a 60% move in the market over the mm-hmm. last two years. I just want to see what the Fed does with interest rates. Well, they cut rates and the markets exploded to the upside. Yeah. Now it's like, I just want to see what happens with the election. So these, these totally aren't your ally. And I think this is the mindset right now of people trying to build their wealth. And it's just like the wrong strategy. Embrace the fact that there's uncertainty right now. Mm-hmm. You can guess who Chris is going to vote for. We all want to know. But, you know, that's not what's going to move the needle. It's the fact that uncertainty is coming in another month. Make your moves before the certainty happens. Absolutely. And I, you're seeing that in the data. There's so much cash that's on the sidelines that has just continued to grow this year. And I think some of that is the election uncertainty that you're seeing. And, you know, you can't control what the masses are going to do or when that cash is going to come out from the sidelines. But do you have cash? And when do you want your portion of that to get invested? <laughs> I think that's the question. That's all you can really control. Yeah, you know, I was I was talking to a prospective client this past week, and he was telling me how he got out of the market in August, and it hasn't really impacted him from his perspective. You know, what you don't realize is how much of the return that you miss. I mean, he missed almost a four percent move in the markets. That's a big that's a big return. Yeah, in one week we had emerging markets go up six percent. You don't get that move back right mm-hmm. afterwards. And that's the other thing too is like I think you have lots of people sitting with cash at six or money market funds at six point five trillion dollars, whatever it is. But then you have the blindly buying the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And you think I'm getting 500 stocks. But what we know is the magnificent seven, seven stocks are 30% of that index now. So your money's just going into more tech, which, you know, it's done well lately. But, you know, the rally's broadening out. um, Mm -hmm. So you want to start to broaden out your exposure, too, because there's a lot of other places that have been working and hasn't been tech the last couple of months. Yeah. And the other thing, too, I think people forget um, is that, yeah, I mean, big tech has done done really well. You know, big, big market change. But if you forget about those interest and dividends, you know, which represents 40% of your return long term, it's like you're missing out on that if you're not in. I don't know, Chris, my crypto, I think it's going to the moon here. And I don't think you need dividends. I think you do, because then, you know, maybe I could be able to afford a nice sweater that you're wearing. <laughs> Probably couldn't, but <laughs> this, is, this is a CEO sweater, Chris. Ryan Louis Vuitton Payne. <laughs> but no, it's a good point. So if you look at a long-term dividends are something like 40% of your return mm-hmm. in the last 10 years, it's only been 15% because these growth stocks have gone through the roof, but that's going to change at some point. And those dividend paying stocks like utilities, real estate stocks, financials mm-hmm. have had a magnificent run the last three months. So things are rotating. You should rotate your portfolio as well. You got to keep up with the fact that 
you know, times are changing and there's a lot of places to put your money. Yeah. And I think that's really something that you want to, you want to think about is we don't want to get out of those tech firms. That's not what we're saying. We just want to say, don't be over concentrated in them. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much they are. You might not think that you're invested, you know, 30% in these <laughs> seven companies, but I would say like 90% of people who come to us yeah. are. And so you want to make sure you're broadening out. You have your real estate, you have your energy. Energy's actually been outperforming a lot of your big tech companies, which I don't think well, people realize. You know what? I have the S and P 500 <laughs> then I have a large cap fund. <laughs> and then just to diversify it, I bought some NVIDIA, I bought some Apple, I bought some Microsoft. So I'm sitting at about like 15 different positions. I mean, man, my money is spread out. You're not guys. well diversified. You don't own Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I have a crypto account. But that's the other thing. If you see where all the money is gone um, in the last like quarter, it all went into large cap funds, S&P 500 funds. And we all know they're all concentrated in the same stocks. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we see this with uh, prospective clients coming in the door. They also own Apple outright. They own NVIDIA outright. They own Microsoft outright. And for those who are feeling some pain, they own some Tesla outright because that hasn't done as well. Um, so they're just overweighting the overweight of the overweight. That's not great diversification or they're sitting with way too much money on money market funds. So like two mm -hmm. wrong places to be. You yeah. know, it's funny. I haven't heard a peep about Tesla in like the last like 12 months. It's amazing when a stock goes down a lot, <laughs> all of a sudden. You know, no one, no one talks about it anymore. It's kind of like the the gambler that goes to the casino. They always tell you about what they win. They never tell you about what their losses are, uh, which is interesting because I think you know Tesla, the stock trades at an insane multiple, right? It's extremely expensive, mm -hmm. and everyone just like such a hater of Musk now. Um, but man, oh man, I mean, like if you look at the robotics, you look at the artificial intelligence. I mean, I still think the guy's brilliant, and what he's doing is brilliant. Maybe the stock's not a great stock, still, the guy's changing the world. I mean, did you see that? rocket come back to earth and I caught it with those arms and yeah. it was incredible. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, that's a good point. But you know, that at the bottom line is like, he's going to keep innovating, but that doesn't change the fact that it depends on who wins the election, Chris. I think if, if, you know, <laughs> if the wrong person wins, I think he'll stop innovating. I think literally he'll just stop trying to change the world. Try to try to get us to Mars. I think he'll just stop that completely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't think he's too, I think you're right. I don't think he's too concerned about the stock price. <laughs> I will say that if we get a million subscribers on this episode, Ryan will tell you who he's voting for. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bottom line. We're, we're not, we're, no one's stopping going to work every day, trying to figure out how to, to grow their wealth, how to better their situation because there's an election. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the attitude you have to have when it comes to investing in the stock market right now is, you know, the world doesn't end very often. And no matter what regulations they put in place, who gets in office, you know, I would say a corporate CEO is much smarter than a politician. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to figure out ways to navigate what the rules are and figure out a way to thrive. I mean, look, we had a lot of regulation the last four years, yet profits are at a record high because, you know, innovation in America is amazing. And Elon Musk is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another reason why you don't want to bet against the stock market before the election. Oh, exactly. Because, I mean, that's what you're doing is you are buying pieces of these companies who are going to figure out how to continue to be profitable regardless of who's in office. And I think that's just something you have to remember as you get closer to the election. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, even like during the pandemic, it's like the entire economy shut down. But like from day one, the CEOs around the world were trying to figure out ways to be profitable again, get people back to work, get product moving again. Yeah, it's like we, we go to a re recession about 15 percent of the time. So it's kind of like bet against the American economy at your peril. Don't wait for the election noise to be over. Take advantage of the volatility, uncertainty. The opportunity is now. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life, and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products. 
whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-A. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, it's hard to believe we're in the middle of October. The end of the year is coming quick. And we have that holiday party every year. Chris gets a little crazy. Maybe says, he drinks a little too much eggnog, uh, does a crazy dance, says some crazy things. <laughs> and then next year, we all look at Chris a little differently. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't really need eggnog to say a couple weird things. Some weird <laughs> things are going to be said today. You can count on it. So look forward to that. This is finally where we get canceled. Our podcast gets canceled. But no, look, it is the end of the year. And for our clients, this is a really good time where you can make some good proactive moves when it comes to your wealth management plan uh, that you want to take advantage of before 2025 starts. And this is something we look at every year for our clients. I think you guys can both attest to that. But this is a really interesting year because it's an election year. And one big thing that's talked about is what is going to happen with the tax rates in the future, right? And so I think there's a lot we can do proactively while we know where tax rates are now. Yeah, right? that's true. I mean, things like Roth conversions, um, you know, where you're taking money out of your traditional IRA, you're paying taxes on today's rates, moving over to a Roth. And you know, with tax rates potentially being lower and going up next year, uh, it's a good time to do that because you're basically getting taxes on sale. Yeah, those tax rates, they sunset at the end of next year. And it's such an awesome time if you're in a low tax bracket this year. Like, and you only have to the end of the year to do it, by the way. You can't mm -hmm. do that next year for this year's tax year. That's important. You know, Along with like tax losses, any losses you have, you can book in your regular taxable accounts, huge. And most of us ignore doing that, which is mm -hmm. a great time to do that. Yeah. And the other big thing that we look at is inherited IRAs. So you have to take money from an inherited IRA every single year. And the rules have gotten a little tricky on this. But if you inherit it in the last couple of years, the IRS has been waiving it. They've just been like, eh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll push this issue down the line. This is the last year that they're saying they're going to waive it. So next year, you're going to have to take those distributions. You have one more year here. We can get a little more creative on tax planning if you have those inherited IRAs. Yeah. And one thing to think about is, especially if you've got an inherited IRA that you got after 2020 mm -hmm. is that you have to take that entire account balance out within 10 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, according to your point with the tax rates being potentially lower this year and going up next year, you know, it might be a good time to take some more of those distributions out and level those out over the next few years. Yeah, we have some clients, though, who actually are preferring to defer it in order to do more things like Roth conversions or saying, eh, you know what, if I take it in nine years versus 10, but I can get more into a Roth, there's some creative things you can do tax planning like that. That's huge, right? Because this year could be one of the lower tax years we'll ever have. Correct. <laughs> Especially with all that deficit spending, I feel like the government somehow is going to tax us more in the future. Just a guess. Um, you know, the other thing to look at, too, is, you know, talking about capital gains. Like if you have a mm -hmm. big capital gain to take, you can break it up between this year and next year, right? You mm -hmm. could sell some this year and then the slate's clean. You could start again in 2025. So you can really break up that tax, uh, especially if you have some concentrated gains. And let's face it, hopefully if you're invested correctly, you definitely have some capital gains this year. Yeah. And if Ryan's your advisor, you have no tax loss harvest this year just because <laughs> you've made so much money. <laughs> so much money. <laughs> And you know another thing to think about too, especially going back to the IRAs, is uh, if you're if you're at that required minimum distribution age, you can actually donate uh, some of your RMD to charity uh, mm -hmm. and that deducts from your income. Uh, they call it a qualified charitable distribution. So you know for those of you that are more charitably inclined or make those kind of contributions, absolutely do it from your IRA. That's a great point. The other thing too is I think you should look at is that emergency fund. And I feel like a lot of times our emergency fund is too big, right? People. Uh, we're sitting on so much more money in money market funds, cash. Mm -hmm. And now with interest rates coming down, right? The Fed's cutting interest rates. Like you have to ask yourself, like, do I have too much money in savings? Our rule of thumb is keep six months worth of savings. But if you have a lot more above and beyond that, it might be a good idea to start getting that money invested. Um, and we talked about this on the first segment, but do it before the election. Get it done. Get that money invested because the Fed's going to probably continue to cut interest rates. And, you know, you got to assess, am I sitting with way too much money in cash, essentially? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm actually really thankful, Ryan, that you keep a big emergency fund just in case you need to bail me out of jail after the holiday party <laughs> this year. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, conversely, Rye, um, one of the things I find, especially with my retired clients, is they tend to have a lot less cash. You know, they've been saving their entire lives and, you know, they really just hate taking money out of their accounts. 
And what happens is they start to draw those accounts down and then, you know, they're calling us in a panic to say, hey, you know, I'm running out of money. We need to get some cash raised. Right. So you might have to re replenish it as well. Yeah. And I think what you want to look at, too, is with any cash you have or making sure that your clients do have enough cash for the next six months is where is that sitting? Because a lot of the bank accounts are still not paying any interest. So that's where even when you want six months worth of cash, you can have that in a high yield savings account. You can have that in a money market account, maybe some short term CDs. Like there's some good options here. And especially now while rates are coming down, but still at good rates, it's a good time to lock into some of those. And that also brings another good point is like, know where all your money is. You know, how many times we sit down with a client and it's like, oh, I think I have this old 401k over here. Mm -hmm. I have this old savings account over here. And a lot of times maybe it is just sitting in cash earning nothing, mm -hmm. but it's a good time to tally up all your assets. Yes. And one thing we do for our clients, which I think everybody should do is get it somewhere digitally where you can log into one place. Mm -hmm. The technology is there now. You can use it and you can actually see where all your investments are. And a lot of the software, like what we use, it can update all of your stuff in real time every single day. Mm -hmm. So I think having a real understanding of where your money is and understanding how it's allocated is something that's underappreciated that I think most people don't take enough time to do. And you're right, you probably have a lot of forgotten accounts that probably need some sort of reallocation. Yeah, and, you know, and speaking of forgotten accounts, particularly forgotten retirement accounts like those old 401ks, is knowing that one, you actually have a beneficiary tied to those accounts, and two, making sure that the beneficiary is the person that you want to receive that money. So you need my social security number because you want to update all your beneficiaries to me, right? Right. <laughs> you know, I just want you to know you are a beneficiary, just a very small percentage. <laughs> <laughs> we all know it, Liam is the, the most important one in that family. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Liam's going to be a very wealthy kid. <laughs> and talking about all the money that you want to get away for yourselves, think about your kids also, which clearly this is my state of life right now. Um, but 529s can be a really good option, especially if you live in a state like New York, which we do, there actually is a state tax deduction by putting money away for your kids in a college education account. So it's absolutely something to take a look at. Yeah, and not to mention a great estate planning tool. If you have grandkids, you can mm -hmm. get a lot of what money front loaded. So exactly. estate taxes could be changing too in the next few years. You got it. Yeah, and it has a triple benefit. You know, you can put it in uh, with a little bit of a tax deduction. It grows tax free. And as long as it's used for qualified education expenses, um, you take it out tax free. It's triple good, Chris. Triple good. <laughs> and the last thing is, is, is like, don't leave money on the table. Uh, if you're part of a 401k, you know, make sure you're putting the maximum amount that you can, or at least up to the match that your company gives you. You know, I've got a, know a lot of people in my friend group that are like, oh, well, you know, I'm only going to put 3% in, but their company's matching six. Like you're leaving money on the table. Free money. Free yeah. money. Yeah. And you know what, Court, you know, you definitely want to make sure you're putting the most amount of money in your 401k because I heard the match is going to be big this year. I hope so. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. I'm broke. <laughs> All right, so hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Chris, 70,500 is the number of previously unknown viruses found through research using artificial intelligence. Man, oh man, that's kind of frightening. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. You know, I feel bad for those uh, people out there that identify as hypochondriacs, learning that there's 75,000 new viruses out there. I don't think I'd leave the house, but... You know, the amazing part is that like even during the pandemic before, you know, AI was really rolling, you know, it only took them like a week or two to geosequence the COVID virus. I mean, you know, imagine what they can do now if we ever have a like another COVID again, like how quickly. Well, I'm definitely leaving the house for another COVID. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Restrictions out the window. Do you think there's really 70,000 more viruses or can it just now identify the like 10 different variations of the same cold we think is one cold, you know? It could be the case. It's above yeah. my pay grade, but yeah, that's probably a good point. So, <laughs> all, all, all I know is I'm going to start wearing a mask on this podcast. <laughs> all right, Courtney, 40.3% of U.S. adults are obese. That's way up from about 30% back in 2000, but it's also down from a recent peak of 41.9% in 2020. Morgan Stanley estimates that more than 7 million people are now taking this new class of obesity drugs, including knockoffs, and they predict that more than 20 million Americans, that kind of blows my mind, will be taking obesity drugs by the 2030s. It's it's crazy. And this is why you're seeing things like Eli Lilly, which is the company that makes these obesity drugs, is doing fantastic because these kind of drugs, there's a huge market for them. And also you have to take it forever. If you eventually stop taking it, the weight comes back. So this is a, you know, interesting thing for the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Like talk about like a quick fix, right? Mm -hmm. You can come right back. And we don't even know what the side effects look like. That's what kind of yeah. scares me is 
what happened to like diet and just good old fashioned working out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, not... I don't, I don't think it's good if you can eat chocolate chip cookies all day and not put on any weight. <laughs> I know that'd be well, very bad for me. Well, here's the sad part. Apparently, cause you lose your appetite. Um, you actually get depressed because one of the biggest joys we have as human beings apparently mm -hmm. is we love, like, I love thinking about food and eating, mm -hmm. but you actually don't have the same, like I'd say lust for food and it actually causes depression. <laughs> That's so, sad. It is kind of yeah. sad. That, that's a downer. All yeah. right. We'll keep moving on here. <laughs> All right. More than two out of three active bond funds beat comparable index funds for the first 12 months ending in June of this year, according to Morningstar's most recent comparison of active versus passive strategies, which is w much higher than stock portfolio managers. Like, I think it's like 85% underperform. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that, uh, you know, in, in you know, in stock portfolios that they consistently underperform the indexes, but you know, in bonds, it actually goes to show you that active management does work. Are you, are you advocating for active management on bonds? <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I hope you enjoyed episode 179, Pain Points of Wealth. If you love our podcast, of course you love our podcast. You can subscribe on iTunes, on Spotify. You can give us that five-star rating. If you're watching on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. Subscribe to our channel. You can click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support for our podcast gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully, you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 